Hello, welcome to GagRule.net. This is GagRule Live on Facebook. I'm your host, Wally Sarkeesian. And today we have an honor to have uh, Peter Abajian with us. He's the executive director of, I guess they call him Paros uh, Foundation. And so uh, since I know a little bit about it, Peter, uh, welcome. Thank you. And please just tell us uh, about yourself, and, and then we go to Paros organization, see what they do. Ah, so uh, I was born in Detroit. Um, I grew up in the Armenian community there. Uh, I made a move to Washington after college uh, and worked for the Armenian cause through the Armenian Assembly uh, for several years, uh, then ultimately made the move to Los Angeles. Um, our foundation is based in uh, Berkeley, California, but I live and work uh, with my small staff here in Los Angeles. Okay, great. So, uh, but I, uh, I was reading there, I didn't know you were with uh, Arme Armenian American Assembly, so <laughs> I just thought you were dealing with Paros, but so just tell me like about uh, first let's start with American Assembly. Are you still with them or? Uh, no, I left the Armenian Assembly in 2006 when we started the Paros Foundation. So you're you're 100 percent dedicated to that Paros Foundation. Uh, Twenty four seven. <laughs> oh man, that's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing how much devoted Armenians are for the certain causes. You know, um, you know we have we're a unique people, as you know, Wally. People like you, people like Armenian activists throughout the country. Um, you know, make this a priority, make helping our people around the world a priority, and, and it, it makes a difference. Yeah, definitely. Really. It's amazing how many people are, uh, they do things, even you don't like, when I, when I went to Armenia many times, I go like, except for this year, twice, and always I find some organization doing a project you never heard about them, you know, and it's, it's just amazing. All right, so just tell us about Paros. Uh, now, what is they do? And uh, I know you, I know me and you, we know, but most people don't know about it. So if you could explain. Of course. Uh, so uh, the Paros Foundation was started in 2006. And we, we started out supporting a few organizations in Armenia. Um, one, of, uh, one of them we named ourselves after, the Paros Chamber Choir. Um, it's a choir made up of primarily people with disabilities, and they uh, do an amazing job promoting the Armenian spirit and the Armenian culture on the world stage. So we started in 2006. Uh, I moved my family from Los Angeles to Armenia for a year, um, and we, uh, we got the foundation started. Um, we got to, uh, we put a small team together on the ground, and we started looking at projects that we could implement. And um, quite frankly, because there was so much work to do in Armenia, um, we developed this, what we think was back then a fairly unique model of project-based philanthropy. So we, we identified very specific things that need to be implemented. We raised the money for it. And then with our own means, our own work crews or our own, you know, hiring locals, we implement the projects ourselves directly. Uh, and you know, now we've, uh, over the years, since 2006, we've raised a little more than $8 million. We've implemented, uh, a, you know, a few hundred projects. Um, everything ranging from a couple of hundred dollar project where we'll take orphans out of the orphanage and take them to the park for a day, um, to things like renovating major infrastructure in these villages. Um, our projects focus on sort of two major areas, although we work throughout Armenia and Artsakh. One is up in Gumri, um, working to try to right the wrongs that that community has faced as a result of earthquake, independence, war, um, and we work with the, the, the children and families in Gumri. And then the other thing we do is obviously up in Tavush, working on the border in those communities that are isolated and frequently under sniper attack from Azerbaijan. So you know quite a bit about Tavush area. Uh, very much, actually. Um, we've worked in uh, most 
of the communities that are along the border, um, both in the Novemberian side of, uh, of Tavush, which is the north, and uh, the, the Berk side, which is a bit to the south, where this recent uh, violence broke out, where the Azeris attacked. How many villages are close to that border there in Tavush? Do you have an idea? Yeah, um, it's about 13. Um, the, some people say 12, some people say 13. And those are villages that are um, right on the border. So within a couple hundred meters of the border. Wow. Yeah. So, so the other side, there is uh, Azerbaijani settlements too? Uh, yes, there are Azeri villages, um, but, you know, throughout that area as well. Um, but, you know, there's a... There's uh, two problems living on the border, honestly. One is that the Azeri protocol is if you want to create terror in those communities, you shoot at villages. Right. So when our farmers are in their fields, when our shepherds are trying to graze their cattle um, or people just, you know, kids going to school, um, you know, if, if the Azeri snipers want, they shoot on the village at will. Um, we don't do that. Our forces shoot at military targets, not civilian populations. And the Azeris do that regularly. So um, we were, unfortunately, uh, we were, I think, the first or one of the first organizations to build a security wall around the kindergarten um, in Nerkin Garmirachpur to protect the children while they were going into the kindergarten and playing on the playground. Um, you, you know, those civilian populations um, have taken a, a major emotional and, and mental hit because they have to be protected yeah. because these areas create terror. The second problem is um, anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of these border villages lands that they can plant, um, they can, you know, harvest wheat, they can graze their cattle are located too close to the border where though th that land can't be used. Because if they use it, these areas will either shoot at them um, or they will uh, or they'll wait until harvest time and they'll burn those fields. They'll launch uh, uh, a couple of rockets into the field and it'll burn a farmer or several farmers entire year of work before they can harvest those crops. Do Armenian Azeris contact each other on individual basis on those borders? You know, it's interesting. The, the, the people we work with that live in those villages oftentimes talk about how they had Azeri friends, how they would go to each other's weddings. Um, but now, no, there's no contact. Um, the, the military speak to one another. Uh, there's communication systems, fragile, but there's communication systems set up along those borders. But, um, but generally, no, the populations no longer communicate. So there is military communication? Uh, yeah, as far as I know, there is, yes. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard there is. Because is the, because, you know, all Armenia, that area, all is mountainous area. Are Armenians on lower side and Azeris high side, or it's on an equal plateau? Or? Very good question, um, and that's part of the part part of the problem in this Bert area that was just attacked is that all of our civilian populations, the majority of them, are in the lower lying areas, and uh, you know we have military posts, and the Azeris have military posts, and in that area, their military posts are at a higher altitude than our posts are. So uh -huh. they have uh, unfettered access as far as line of sight to our villages. They have line of sight to, you know, our infrastructure there. And we don't. We're looking uphill and they're basically looking downhill upon us. Sort of a Stepana Gert Shushi situation from Artsakh. Because, um, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. When I was in uh, this town, or I, I don't think it's city, but town called Khachik, Mm -hmm. uh, so we went there. It's extremely beautiful driving to go there. Um, but they are, you could see they are high and Nahichivan is right here. It's like they are looking at them, you know. So it was, they more had the control. They could see even what is happening there. But I guess in this situation is different. It's opposite. It's opposite. And when the war broke out um, and the Azeris launched this attack, uh, in the Bert area on those four villages, uh, Chinari, Moses, uh, Aikipar, and Nerkin Garmirachbuer, um, our, our forces successfully took 
um, a military post that's critical for our defense there. So we took one of the high posts. Now um, this, uh, this, this, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So that, um, that infrastructure is critical for us to hold. Um, and I think that's part of why these areas are so uh, adamant about, um, you know, making all these threats about attacking um, again and again, because they lost a, a critical post. Um, from that post, we can see a lot of their infrastructure, including the natural gas pipeline, including the security road. Um, and honestly, now we look down upon their village of Ogdam. So uh, it's, a, it's a very strategic post to hold. Um, and it will also help hopefully balance the, the power uh, there and incre uh, decrease the amount of attacks on these villages, uh, our villages. I think Armenian uh, defense minister one time, he said in Armenian, he said, if you start, uh, you know, if you start war, you lose land or something like that. So obviously they did. <laughs> They, they did. And, you know, we're talking about one military post to the next. And sometimes these posts are very, very close. It might be one mountaintop to the next, but it might be 100 meters apart or 150 meters apart. So um, they're very, very close. Uh, and it's a very there's like a, a set of mountains that almost separate us. Um, it's it's a very precarious situation. Um, and it was uh, quite um, it, it's a, it, this is a new benefit that we have there, and it's, it's very important that we're able to hold it. I don't believe you know so much. I never had anybody explain this much to me, you know, as you did. You look like you know the geography pretty good. It's, I wish I didn't. Um, I don't know every hill like my colleagues in Armenia or like the villagers that live there, but, you know, we're at a kindergarten in Chinari, for instance. We, we've renovated the kindergartens completely, just they're beautiful in Chinari, Moses, Nerkin Garmin, Akbir, and Aikepar. All four communities that were attacked um, by the Azeris this, this couple of weeks ago, we've renovated those kindergartens completely and they're beautiful. All right, and is this so, right now? This was in the last two years. Oh, okay, um, okay. Four of those have been projects of Paros. We spent anywhere from, I think the least expensive was 35,000 and the most expensive is about 70,000. Um, we've, we've rebuilt those kindergartens. They look terrific. But you're standing in the yard of the kindergarten where children would be coming to school there. And you look up and there's a Missouri military post above you. Wow. It, it's, it's so... Um, That's unbelievable. It's scary that, you know, these families and their children have to come to that kind of a... Live in that kind of environment, work in that kind of environment, where any minute you're there, you know, you could be shot. I mean, that's how these people live there. Wow. What a life. Yeah, it's tough. So, so almost 12, 13 villages are always vulnerable to a Zeri attack. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. You know, and our, our policy in these communities have been, uh, you know, like our visitors, our donors will come or our, our friends will come and will say, oh, let us take you to the border. And they're like, oh, it's four hours away. I don't want to, you know, drive four hours to see you. <laughs> That's happened <You> know, to me. <laughs> it's important that we invest in these yeah. communities. Because the, yeah. the stronger these communities are, the more stable the populations will become. And thus, those villages will be secure. Um, if we have people leaving those communities every week to go work someplace else, even in Ichevan, it it lessens the security of those communities. Um, an empty village is easy to take over. A vibrant village is a security point. Yeah. So um, do you have like a, a head office or branch office in, in Armenia, in Yerevan or something? Um, we don't really have a head office anywhere. Uh, let me explain our setup. So uh, in the U.S., um, our foundation is registered and run out of Berkeley, California. Um, our boss, uh, the founder of our, our organization um, and uh, our, our, uh, our chairman, Roger Strauch, has his office in Berkeley, California. Our accounting team is based there. Um, we're share, we, share the, we share our accounting team with his business. Um, I live and work out of Los Angeles with my colleague, Narine. Um, and we have a small donated office. One of our members gave us uh, some office space uh, for free. So we, we have our little office set up. And then in Armenia, we have um, a team of four people. 
And they basically work from their homes um, and we communicate via Slack and Skype and cell phones and computers. And that's how we move our projects forward. Wow, that's amazing. That's really amazing and doing so much. I saw on, on your one of your websites where it says what, 200 projects and they're working on and uh, it's coming another 200. And what is that, about $8 million you guys raised? It's just amazing. It's you know, and we work to build the trust of our donors because all of our administrative costs are covered by Roger and his family. Um, so they, they underwrite the operation and our admin costs um, of implementing these projects. So I spend uh, my time in the U.S. raising funding specifically for projects. So if, you know, if a project pencils out at $10,000 and I secure a $10,000 donation, every penny of that is used to implement the project. Um, you know, my salary and the salary of our staff and, uh, you know, the expense of going and coming to Armenia when we can travel uh, is all covered by, uh, by Roger and his family. And that, that transparent, that leads to tra uh, a heightened level of transparency. So donors are, uh, are certain that where their money is going to exactly the purpose they intended to. That's incredible. Well, who is this Roger guy? Family. So Roger's a really cool guy. He has a great story. Roger. I wish uh, I had this picture, but I don't have it to put it here. Uh, Roger and his family grew up in, Roger grew up in Boston with his family and his dad was a famous physicist for the U.S. And uh, over the, uh, during the Soviet period, he developed a relationship on behalf of the U.S. with uh, Ardem and his brother, uh, the Alhanian brothers in Armenia. And they were both building a synchrotron accelerator. The Alhanian brothers were building it for the Soviet Union and he was overseeing it for the U.S. So they got to know each other, wow. and, and Roger actually visited Soviet Armenia in 1970 as a 13 or 14 year old kid. Um, so he had a very long, has a lifelong tie to Armenia. Um, his family's Armenian. Uh, he um, makes, you know, he's he's made frequent trips to Armenia, um, and he really wanted to help. And when I uh, when I made the decision to leave the assembly, he called me up and said, "Let's let's partner and let's do a project in you know, Let's start a foundation that we can." you know, benefit uh, projects in Armenia for, so. That's, that's amazing. Yes, amazing. Well, this is almost sounds like uh, this uh, uh, American University in Yerevan, how uh, like three physicists started and during the, the height of the war and they did not even uh, fuel that to cut the trees, but those people were thinking university, you know, it's, it's just yeah. incredible, you know. And I went there, I interviewed, they gave me a tour in there. It was just amazing, just amazing. But you know, you guys are doing such a great guy, a uh, great job. And I, I always I was interested, you know, too. But in Yerevan, remember, you, you arranged that bus, things we go. But then I was hooked with this Anna Agopian, the wife of the prime minister meeting. And they keep saying me today, you no know, tomorrow. And, and then happened, they said, well, Friday, which was the day we're supposed to go to your village. And then suddenly they called me, said, oh, can you come like today, you know? And, and then I already told you guys, well, I can't make it. And I just, it was screwed up, you know. But I really wanted to go, you know. I really wanted to go. I'm but hopeful that next year we'll all be in Armenia and we can arrange trips to uh, back to these villages. Uh, we're, uh, so the, the project you were referring to was the ribbon cutting of the kindergarten we built from scratch in the village of Bavanis. Um, and it was a, uh, the building is terrific. Um, it's in, uh, it, you know, we built it from the ground up because the old kindergarten was too close to the border and they literally abandoned that building. So um, this is a brand new facility uh, in, a, in a very safe part of the, the village. Um, and now we're, our team's actually working on a footbridge and a, and a beautiful set of stairs through a, a tiny little forest to get the kids to the main road on a, in, a, in, a, in a simple, efficient fashion. So the parents will be able to pull over on the roadside up above, and the kids will come down the stairs and cross a bridge to the kindergarten. Awesome. <laughs> very, very, very nice. Do material, where where materials come? Do they have in there, or do you take them from Yerevan, all that stuff? Um, so just about everything comes in from Yerevan, but there's local suppliers in those areas as well. Um, we have uh, excellent relationship with one company in Bert, 
Um, we have excellent relationships with two window companies in Bert. And then up in Novemberian, there's, uh, there's a material supplier as well. Um, and depending on what the nature of the project is, we might send the initial stuff from Yerevan and then buy all the rest of the supplies locally. So, so this is not only help that particular village, it, the, 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 it get distributed. You know, the other villages sell something, they come and work. So it just create working environment and they, it's amazing, you know. That's, yeah. that's our hope is to create these local economies. And, you know, one thing that I'm very, very proud of, uh, in addition to the material that we buy, you know, locally, um, our crews, um, we, you know, our team in Armenia is only four guys. We don't have um, a, a, a construction crews, but we hire local construction crews. Um, we train them to our specs because we have, you know, pretty high expectations of how we want these facilities to be. We joke with them when we say, you know, make sure you're doing that roof properly because you, you offer, you're offering a lifetime guarantee. You know, if there's ever a problem, you're coming back to fix it. And that's exactly how we operate. Yeah. Um, in, in that, uh, over the last, you know, 10 years, we've developed uh, a four distinct work crews up in that Tavush area that move from project to project. So, you know, now with the crisis uh, that happened in the Baird area with those communities, um, we have one, two, three crews working there now, and I suspect we'll pull our fourth crew and bring them in there too. So we'll, you know, we have this ability um, to employ all these people uh, from project to project, and many of them have not, you know, have stopped going to Russia for work. Um, they've bought new cars, they've had more children, um, and they're living better because they have steady work through us. So well, that's really, really happy. That's exactly how we create the economy, right? You buy a car, the car needs repair, somebody else is going to fix it. And, and, and so that's really, it's, it's amazing job you guys doing there, you know, creating this little economy there. It's not just building the house or the school, it's just how many people get involved in. And they will be proud of it too, because they build it their, their own community, you know. Exactly. They take pride in the work that they do and they, uh, you know, now they're part of our, you know, sort of expanded team. We don't have them on salary, but they know that, you know, we have another project for them. We have another project for them. Um, you know, it's harvest season, like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So, you know, they were taking long weekends so they can go and, you know, pick their fruit or work in their fields and then come back and work with us. So we gave them a little break here and there so they could get their, uh, you know, their farms and things in order. Uh, but generally the model works pretty well. We're very happy. We're but fortunate. Is, is the area has like uh, uh, sort of agricultural things like like Arine, others, they have like fruit trees and stuff. Is that area has those kind of things? It does. Um, the, the climate in Tavush is, uh, uh, especially in these areas that we're working, is among the best. You can grow pretty much everything there. Mm -hmm. When you're driving there, you see grapes, you see, you know, there's fruit trees, there's wood trees, there's walnut trees. Um, there, there's, there's, uh, you know, pretty much everything can grow there. Um, the issue is that, um, so much of that border community was abandoned for years. And now, you know, slowly the communities are starting to maybe reclaim some of that land, but, you know, you have irrigation problems because you, the water infrastructure has crumbled in many of those communities. You have, you know, this sniper problem, um, and then you have, you know, the problem of, uh, seed money for these farmers. Now, the, the government's doing a much better job offering, you know, 0% loans for farmers to expand or to install irrigation. Um, they're doing things like providing, uh, they've exempted these border communities from their land taxes uh, so that, you know, a business, if, if a farmer starts a business or somebody opens a cannery or whatever, they can operate uh, without paying tax for a period of time because they're creating employment in these communities. You know, typically the employment, the largest employer in any of these villages is the military. Um, these men leave their families two weeks out of the month and go up to the border and work a military post defending our borders as contract soldiers. Oh, I um, see. And, you know, around 300 bucks a month for that. Um, and then the other two weeks, they work on their homes. They, you know, work in their farms, their fields and that kind of thing. Oh, what a nice job. <laughs> they, they defend their land and, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. is the... Is the far, is the residents there? Are they armed? Do they have their own guns and stuff like that? 
Uh, I don't know. Um, I would assume so. Um, but, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that. Well, I know in, the, in villages always they have, you know, some kind of protection, you know, they have some stuff, but, but yeah. Well, I think they have their, I think they have their hunting equipment. Yeah, yeah, um, that's what I'm talking. Yeah. So, um, I just got some of those pictures from, I guess, your website things. Uh, like, this is what, this, what project was this? So, this project... Let me put my glasses on here. Um, this is our service Armenia crew. Uh, these are young people from the U.S. Uh, that go to Armenia every summer, except this summer, and work on our uh, on different projects for Paros. Um, so they they tour the country for a month. They live with one another and um, in a in a in a home uh, in Yerevan, and they tour the country. They have a blast and they work on these service projects. So. Um, this project actually is, uh, could be in the village of Vahan, um, or could be Kana Caravan. I can't tell from this photo. Um, we worked at both. And what they're doing is they're mixing concrete, yeah. loading it into objects, uh, taking it in, and we, we did subfloors. Uh, so they, you know, they do manual labor, they work together, they learn teamwork, um, and they invest their time and labor into um, one of these school projects. Uh, and typically they love it. We've had about 110 children go through these, young people go through this uh, summer program. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, we had to cancel this summer. Uh, but I'm looking forward to next summer and having even a larger program. So there is this one here. Uh, it says Armenian Tree Project Paros Foundation. So those are uh, your team this stuff? This is a point project we did with uh, the Armenian Tree Project. So what, what happened was the village of Rind uh, is in is not too far outside of Adeni. Oh, this is Rind. I know. I think that's their, in their village head or something. What was his name? I forgot. The, uh, the, third, the second one from the left. Yeah, I'm not sure who that is. I haven't met him, but Ashot is the guy on the far left, and he's the principal of the school. Um, their kitchen cafeteria, the school operates with, you know, a couple hundred children, but there was no kitchen and cafeteria to properly prepare meals or have a normal space for the children to eat in. So we partnered with the Tree Project. We raised money together. We did the renovation of the kitchen and cafeteria. And as you can see from the photo, it came out beautifully. And the, uh, and the Tree Project planted 550 fruit trees and other trees around the school property. Uh, and it's spectacular. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's really I, th a beautiful I think it was a great I think it was two sixteen. They got all this karas, you know, the wine uh, jars, and so we went there. They did the opening, you know, but seven of them they put together in rent. So he was there, and we went to Arine and other villages, you know. So yeah, so that's why I saw that. I remember, he was that's the, right. so the. The ceramics teacher at that, the art teacher at that school, um, took over the outside shed where the kitchen and cafeteria was before the renovation, and now they've created a ceramic studio and they make m smaller kadasas there. Yeah. Okay. So. Got this one here. This is. So what is uh, like I I know those people like you know that I uh, twice I was I was there la I, last year was uh, they had this their Olympic there and then one day uh, I went with them to this uh, Armaver village and it's 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 incredible like how that uh, why what was the name I forgot uh, the lady who's running that CEO uh, or Anna no it's not Anna. I, I, I just uh, she's gonna kill me if I how I forget her name. Yeah. Their new executive director is Tenny. Okay, uh, so must be new. Yeah, yeah. but she she's was like good. she's originally from Iran. Uh, she uh, she was the CEO. She organized all that. You know, it's an incredible job. Like three hundred girls they have uh, around the country. You know, they do this soccer. This my stupid lights keep going on and off. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so that's so. So, do you deal anything with them or? We do. So uh, the Goals Women's Soccer is an excellent example of how our partnerships with local organizations can work. So Goals um, started in Armenia uh, several years ago by two Peace Corps volunteers. And then they got interest from some folks in the U.S. that wanted to um, help them and, and propel this program forward and expand it. But, you know, setting up a 501c3 organization so you can, you know, raise funds in the U.S. and support projects in Armenia is actually a fair amount of work and expense. So, so they came to us and said, hey, we have this great project in Armenia. We'd like to expand it. It needs some help and guidance, but we also you know, want to raise money for it. Can we partner? So we, we help facilitate several organizations' projects in Armenia. We have Musical Armenia. We have Goals. We now have Armenia Support Fund that's doing the COVID uh, small business grants, um, those kinds of organizations m m may be able to operate without us, but it's much easier to operate as partners of Paros than it is to do it on your own. So goals started. Um, we've, uh, you know, we help facilitate the funding there. We work with them on the ground in Armenia to, you know, may offer some nonprofit administrative guidance. Um, and they're doing terrific. They mm -hmm. have tournaments across the country. Yeah. Uh, we try to um, we try to help promote that, and you know, and their goal is very specific: help change the the role of women in society through sports. You know, giving them extra confidence, giving them uh, changing perceptions across the board with women's playing. You know, women playing soccer because of that. You know, taboo that oh no, you know, girls can't play soccer; only boys can play soccer. Um, it's really an excellent organization, yeah. and they're doing. They're doing a great job. Every time I have a chance, I go there and I, I talk to them. All right, so I have one here. I don't know where this is. The Narkin Kar Karmir Akhpur. Karmir Akhpur. Uh, right. This is our, one of our showpiece schools. Um, this building has been, uh, in the 90s, it was under fire. Um, there's several... Uh, spots on the outside of the, the side and the back of the building that have been hit by rockets. Um, we've completely renovated this school soup to nuts. Um, it's a three, it's three main buildings that make up this larger campus. Uh, there's about 95 children that go there. The principal's vibrant. Um, and uh, one of our uh, major sponsors has, uh, has made it his goal to make this community better. Um, so he's continuously investing in projects in this village, and uh, we've we renovated first the elementary school, then the high school, then the administrative wing. Uh, we've done cosmetic stuff to the gym. Um, we've uh, outfitted the children with uh, gym clothes uh, and shoes a couple of times. Uh, their kitchen cafeteria is renovated, um, and now we just finished um, their science labs. Uh, their wood shop, home at room. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. We have children now leaving Bert and coming to this school. Three new children signed up for this coming school year um, from the neighboring town because this school is a great school. And uh, the Minister of Education, um, Anai Kartunian, had just visited uh, two weeks ago, I think, and um, approved the school to reopen uh, in September. Um, because it, it can easily meet the COVID, you know, social distancing requirements that, you know, they're trying to implement for schools. Um, it's a beautiful campus, um, and we're really proud of the work there. And on top of it now, we have an economic development project that we're going to try to implement. Um, we're going to plant a thousand fruit trees on that school campus and uh, not only support the environmental education of the students, but um, work with them to make this a social enterprise and, uh, benefit the community through, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, produce that, that it'll have in a couple of years. What is you, what can you guess the population of that little town is? Uh, there's about, there's just over a thousand people there. Oh, okay. That's good enough. Yeah. And um, it's kind of cool. We started work in this village in 2012 uh, and we noticed that it, we looked back around 2016, 2017, and starting in 2012, because of these improvements to the medical center, the school, the water infrastructure, the kindergarten, 
um, the the 911 service building. I know we've done uh, economic development projects with individual families. We've done home repairs for families. We've you know we've really invested in this community. We noticed the birth rate doubled. So instead of every year six seven kids being born in the village, there's 17, 16, 15, 18 children being born. Yeah. Um, because of this, we ran out of space at the kindergarten, so we're just we just completed the expansion of the kindergarten to accommodate these larger number of children now that are coming through this. So what happened when they finish kindergarten? There is um, like um, middle school, high school, stuff like that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Armenia defines kindergarten and preschool uh, differently throughout the country. So kindergarten are typically uh, two and three-year-olds or three, three and four-year-olds, and then they go to um, uh, preschool for a year, and then they start first grade. But in this village, there's no preschool, so they stay at the kindergarten for a couple of years, you know, four and five or three, four and five, and then they'll start first grade at the school. And there's one school in the village, and that school is uh, first grade to 12th grade. Well, so obviously universities, they have to go to Yerevan. The problem, the problem. Yerevan, um, there are other options, hmm. um, but yeah, typically they'll go to the city for school. I think they should, they should take some of those government offices, move them out of Yerevan to create jobs and, and transportation and all that stuff. And so it's everything so much concentrated into Yerevan. Uh, it's it, they they just have to move out some of that stuff. Uh, but I I think that would be very smart. The more yeah. they can decentralize, the more benefit it brings to these other cities. Yeah, and they'd be close to the other population, you know, and they have they have to do less traveling in each region, you know. But but that's I mean, like a Minister of Defense and Foreign Affairs, he has to be in this close to the government, but other uh, ministries, they could move them, like environment and I don't know, whatever, you know, so they could be moved, yeah. It makes perfect sense. And, you know, with um, with the university system, you know, there are universities uh, regionally, but they really could do a better job beefing them up and making them more um, truly a, an educational center. Like, there's no reason why you couldn't take the agrarian university and put it, yeah. you know, in a village to, to, to have a living classroom there, you know? Yes. Um, for having it in Yerevan or in Banazor yeah. or whatever. Yeah, lots of research stuff. It could be outside. You know, it's much, the kids in the villages are even much smarter than the kids in the cities, you know, because they're more attached to the land. You know, they know where the fruit comes. They know where the water comes, you know. And people in the city, they, or they grow up and they know the... Electricity come from the walls, the water come from the walls, you know. So, so it's better, you know, they, they really know the, the real truth, what air comes, they appreciate the life much better, you know. So they could yeah. move lots of things all around instead of just, you know, in, in Yerevan, nothing move, you know, like if there is one event, the whole city got locked down, you know. And so, but will they do it? I don't know. So, but what we have to do? You know, we were super happy this year to see that um, some of the celebrations got moved to Armenia's second largest city, Gumri. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they've done, um, you know, they moved the car uh, customs clearance to Gumri from Yerevan. You know, so they've started doing a little bit of that. Um, but, you know, there's there's major cities throughout Armenia that can use this redevelopment. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, you just put... One ministry in this city, another ministry, another city, you know, yeah, let them go all around to understand the, the life of that area. You know, like they're all those, they go there in our Yerevan, everything is right side by side, you know. So, yes. but all we have to do, we have to suggest whether they do it or not. That's, that's a big bureaucracy, you know. So, uh, so dealing, dealing with the government, how, how easy is or with the g bureaucracy? Um, you know, it's uh, it takes work. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, in the first, you know, up to the revolution, um, our process was we try to, uh, you know, we always control our funding. We always control our uh, team of labor. You know, we don't, uh, we were, we were, there was lots of suggestions to 
hand money over to the government and they'd implement the project so much better than us and yada, yada, yada back in the day. And we completely ignored that process. Um, we were just this, you know, little foundation working from America and doing what we wanted to do. Um, but we always had excellent relationships with the local villages, with the local mayors, um, because we wanted them to put a contribution into our work as well. So, you know, if we were renovating a school, for instance, we'd say, okay, you know, village mayor, um, all the demo for this building, for this process is on you guys. You need to bring your crews in and do that. That's your local contribution or you need to haul all the trash away or, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, because if they put some skin in the game, they would appreciate the end result much better and yeah. care for it long term much better. Uh, so we always maintained those relationships and it was, it was a working model. When the revolution happened, we were very happy because now we thought we could partner even at a greater level with the government. And that is indeed happening. Um, we work very closely with the regional governors. Um, you know, we've met with the prime minister. We've worked with, um, you know, members of parliament. The, the system is still bureaucratic. So I don't want to say that everything's terrific, but it yeah. works. You know, they have rules and they're doing their best to follow the rules. And sometimes it takes extra time because there's rules, um, but that's okay. But that's okay. Wow. That was, that was great. You know, like... Uh... I learned lots from you. Uh, I'm sure lots of our viewers, they will see this, uh, that you explain everything so brilliantly. Um, Thank you. You're uh, way too kind. No, I'm just telling you the truth. Um, and I hope one day we get, uh, we get Roger here and see why, why he's doing this stuff, you know. <laughs> but who knows? Uh, we could set that up, I'm certain. Yeah, it's, that's very interesting because... Know his uh, history as the way you explained uh, how he started from Soviet era, you know. So, well, I don't know. I'm gonna let you la last word, uh, whatever you wanna say, and we'll close it because we could talk hours, you know, about this subject. I, I very much appreciate your time. Um, we were, you know, all kind of shocked when we woke up yesterday um, as to what's happened in Lebanon and with our. Uh, with our family and friends um, and the Lebanese people there. Um, this has been one hell of a ride, I have to say, this last year. Um, you know, we started with our regular projects in Armenia. We switched to doing COVID relief. Now we did, you know, then we did war relief. Um, and now everything's gotten all jumbled up. So as Armenians, I think we all have to do something. So my message to all of our viewers is, Join Parles, join you, join somebody else, but do something because our people around the world need us right now and we need to step it up uh, to whatever degree that we can. Um, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, Lebanon too, it's, uh, they're, they're really, it's amazing, like, uh, this is horrible. I mean, how stupid they are, they leave that stuff in there for six years and nobody knows about it. I mean, there was some article today I published Apparently, it's a Russian ship. They brought that things in there, and it's a, it's a bit. We don't know things still coming out. You know, it's uh, it's a wrong news. Yeah. I was. Uh, we were talking to uh, my wife's family uh, yesterday afternoon, and uh, one of them was injured when the glass blew out of her, you know, living room, and it cut her pretty badly. So she had to go get stitches. And they left Beirut and went up into the mountains to one of the hospitals there to get stitched up because there were so many people in the ER that there was no way to get in for, you know, something like stitches. Um, and I just, I kind of imagined how that would be, um, you know, in Armenia. In Armenia, they typically, you know, put a bandaid on you in the village and rush you to the city. Uh, and now the situation's so dire in Lebanon that they're rushing people out to the villages to get medical care. When, I, when I heard that, the first thing came in mind it was Armenian nuclear power plant. I mean, imagine if something happened to that. They, that Armenia would be end, finished. Yeah, it would be. And I honestly believe we have to put pressure on that government to close that down. To close that down and find some other source of energy. That is so close to Yerevan. I mean, the whole Armenia is Yerevan. And if there's something happened to that, either by accident or by war, that will completely wipe out those, the Armenian nation. And it's, it's just something horrible. I think 
people like you, me, and others have to bring this to the government attention. They have to remove that thing. It's, a, it's like a big elephant sitting in there. It's a time bomb. You never know when that thing. I know they need energy. It's easy to say. But we have one here, right here, that closed it in, uh, uh, in Southern California. Like the, it's about 20 minutes where we are. You know, yeah. and so, uh, so it's 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 uh, this, you know this uh, th this accident is just has to remind every person, every country, how dangerous these things are. Like U.S. has those nuclear power plant; they have this uh, nuclear warheads. I mean, accident could happen, you know, yeah, and uh, it it could be disaster, you know. So, but I don't know. I thank you very much. Well, thank you, Wally. Um, thank you very much for making the time to uh, talk with me and uh, let me run on about our, our work in Tavush. Um, thank you all very much. Very interesting. I really enjoyed it. I hope you come back again with some new stuff. Uh, just before I go, how are you guys managing it with this coronavirus in your project? Is it now completely stopped or? So, uh, you know, our children's center in Gumri, Tebi Arach, uh, we had to close down um, as most children's centers close down. And we're in the process of reopening uh, to gear the children up for September 1st. So I think we're going to be opened uh, the 15th of the month um, to get to do some tutoring and try to get the kids back to uh, back to school in a safe way. Um, the construction projects that we had running, we essentially quarantined everybody in place. Um, so the work crews were able to continue working. They just had to stay at the at the schools or the kindergartens. They oh, I see. Out. That's it a good. worked out pretty well. <laughs> well that's a good one. Yeah, yeah it, it, it did. It worked out pretty well. So you com um, you communicate with them with uh, Facebook and all every other uh, way of communication. Uh, we primarily use uh, Viber and Skype. Uh, we do you know we do regular meetings uh and then we do um we have slack which is a project management sort of app uh and that helps a lot because the team can upload photos there from their cell phones or from their computers and i can see them and we have ongoing discussions um regularly so typically every morning i start around seven and for the first two or three hours i'm on the phone with armenia uh, in one form of communication or another. Sometimes oh. Messenger is easier to speak on, sometimes Vibers. It all depends on bandwidth and where they are in the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it was very informative. I enjoyed it. And hopefully we see you again. All right. Absolutely. Just stay there for a minute. Okay. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you in other episodes. And uh, have a nice day.